Hello guys, today we are talking with Julie Driver about learning the way we learn and her teaching experience. Stay tuned. Hello Julie, thank you for talking to me. Tell us about yourself and a bit about your profession. Okay, so um, my name's Julie Driver. I've taught primary age children for 20 years. I gave up about five years ago. Um, I just started to struggle with the way they wanted us to teach the children and the national curriculum. I just thought it wasn't going in the right way for young children. Um, yes, I'm qualified to teach five to 11 year olds and I live in Surrey in England for half the year and I spend half the year here. Um, I taught in a very wealthy um, infant school for the last seven years teaching six and seven year olds. So we had a few bilingual children, but I would say 90% of the children I taught um, were very um, middle class British. Okay. You said you didn't totally agree with the national curriculum. What do you mean by that? Um, I felt that when the children came to me in September, because I used to have to put them through their exams in the May, um, I had to really narrow the curriculum and their learning experience because I was assessed as a teacher on my performance and the targets I had to set the children and their level of achievement. And I just felt that it really narrowed the um, subject matter and a lot of creativity and um, spontaneous learning went out the window, really. Okay. Um, when do British kids start learning a foreign language? Do they learn a foreign language? Um, officially, Key Stage 2, which is um, 7 to 11 year olds. Okay. But it's probably just um, an hour, one hour a week, which is never enough. Okay. In my class, um, it wasn't part of the Key Stage 1 curriculum. But, um, for example, one year my teaching assistant was Spanish, mm -hmm. so we taught the children how to count up to 30 in Spanish, and when they answered the register every day, um, they um, uh, would say their number okay. um, in Spanish, and also um, I used to teach them French numbers as well. Mm -hmm. But there was no room in the curriculum at all for us to spend any time teaching a second language. Do they have bilingual schools in the United Kingdom? There are bilingual schools. Um, the government over the last five, perhaps ten years, has recognised the need. Um, in 2012, one of the first bilingual state-paid-for, state-funded schools uh, was in Brighton, which is only about an hour away from me. Um, since then, um, there are a few more state-funded schools across the UK, but most of them are still known as international schools and they are private fee-paying schools. However, overall in, state, in the state sector, children, there are 300 different types of language that are spoken within a primary school. So as a teacher, uh, sometimes they come with extra help to help them learn language, um, but, but most of the time you are just left to cope with these children who arrive on your doorstep in your classroom, okay. um, who sometimes have very little in the way of English language. So it's really difficult because over the years they've cut the funding and you don't necessarily get somebody to help. Um, children are amazing though. They learn so quickly. And I remember, oh, years ago, I had a little girl, when I was at, teaching at junior school, I had a little girl come to me whose father worked for one of the mobile phone companies. And in her eight years of life, she'd lived in five different countries. And she could, not fluent in five different languages, but she was amazing. What are some of the characteristics of uh, kids of that age? Um, what their learning ability, um, the characteristics, okay, they have brains like sponges, basically. Um, by the age of three, children have um, 
the best time for them to start learning and equally the best time for them to start learning a second language is by the time they're four because at the age of three um, they have their brain is developed enough to be able to soak in 50 percent of um of new things by the age of eight there's an added 30 percent so to actually get, get children to start thinking about learning a different language um the best time to start them is age four but they just they just love to learn and you as your role as a teacher is to make sure that you embrace that enthusiasm and the fact that they can just absorb so much at such a young age. Uh, what type of activities would you recommend to use uh, as a teacher for the children of that age? Okay, so there is a theory that depending on the age of the child is how long they can um, hold your you can hold their attention. So at the age of six or seven, um, every lesson I taught, and bear in mind I used to teach 11 subjects, um, I used to start the, the, the session on the carpet at my feet. And you used to, the idea is you model, you teach the new activity that you want them to go away and do, and you model what you want them to do. So the, at the age of six and seven, you can only expect them really to sit on the carpet for 15 minutes. If you want to, if I wanted them to sit longer, I used to do what I used to call brain breaks. So um, after 15 minutes, I, if I could see that I was losing some of their attention, we used to get up, we used to jump around the classroom or do um, star jumps or just something just to break the um, pattern. And then that used to bring them back down to where I wanted them again. Um, everything... When you teach young children, everything is very practical. So I used to spend hours and hours on my lounge floor making resources that they could use. Um, you don't learn from um, books um, or just listening. There are three types of, um, there's three ways in which people um, learn. Um, auditory, kinesthetic and visual. Auditory is obviously listening, and most of us don't learn like that because whatever we hear just goes out of our head most of the time. Kinesthetic is when you actually do an activity, and most of us are kinesthetic learners. Visual, um, kinesthetic, and auditory, um, again, just by listening, um, you lose a lot of the learning because if it doesn't interest you, then it just doesn't stick. So most of us are a combination of visual and kinesthetic learners. So um, teaching young children, you do an awful lot of modelling what you want them to do, and then they actually go away and do it, and you use practical resources to help them visualise and to learn for it to stick. You said that the kids of that age are like a sponge. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think they learn easily? They remember things? Um, I found a really good quote, actually. Okay. Um, and this is this is this is more directed at um, why it's so good for children to at an early age to um, become bilingual. Okay. And um, it comes from the quote I found comes from the Cambridge University Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics. Okay. Linguistics. Okay. Um, they could they obviously can describe it much better than I could. So I found this nice little quote. So basically, the, the theory is that young minds are more adaptive to developing more skills at an early age because obviously the, the, the brains of a young child are constantly developing and the neurons are constantly providing new connections. And this is the quote, that learning is more organic and less systematic than for older children. So rather than just learning um, times tables by rope when they're older, it just became, I used to teach, you know, two times two and five times ten, etc., as, as a song. Oh. Um, so it's not only enjoyable and fun, but it's not systematic. Okay. You're, not, you're not learning by rote. Um, and it goes, the quote goes on to say, they develop stronger, more effective neural pathways leading to more creative and imaginative modes of thought.
They're better to cope with tasks that involve attention, memory and concentration and the mental gymnastics needed to constantly manage two or more linguistic systems increase cognitive flexibility and makes learning easier. Um, And that's true for all areas, not just if if you're teaching a second language. Um, You do lots of different activities that lead to the same answer, but you teach those activities in different ways so that every child um, has more opportunity to grasp what you're trying to teach them. Are there any differences in our natural learning abilities? Yes, I think we, we've all got equal possibilities to learn. It's the role of the teacher to identify strengths and weaknesses, um, how the child learns. So are they a kinesthetic learner? Are they... Uh, visual, um, you have to tap into what they really enjoy. Um, obviously, there's things that you have to teach them that you know are pretty dull, but that's just part of life, yeah. at least for everybody. Um, they, Some children are obviously stronger at academic subjects, whereas other children are stronger with creative, creativity or sport. Um, And I used to say to children who were struggling in a particular subject, look, we can't all be good at everything. You know, you're really good at maths or you're really good at playing football. Um, doesn't matter. Just um, do your best and you will achieve. But you've got to get young children. It's part, a big role of a teacher, of a teaching young children is to make them want to take risks and To, to make them realize that it's okay to make mistakes. So is the purpose of the classroom to prepare a child uh, for an exam? How do you feel about standard classroom learning experience with books? Um, like I said at the beginning, one of the reasons I stopped teachers because I didn't like the way British education was going. I found it was too structured, They came to me in the September. All I could focus on was get them to pass their exams in the May. Um, I thought there was too much pressure put on the children. We tried to, at my school, we tried to make it fun and they didn't realise they were taking exams. Yeah, the way I prepared them was actually quite sneaky. We're in danger of, you know, taking all the creativity and the spontaneous learning out of the curriculum. And to be quite honest, The national curriculum in the UK doesn't always suit boys. Boys? Yeah. We ex- in my opinion, we expect boys to sit and um, for a literacy hour or a numeracy hour at the age of five or six, when really all they want to do is play, fight and roll about under the tables playing with Lego. I think formal learning in the UK starts too early. I think um, when they come to school... Um, in the reception year at the age of four straight five they learn through play and I think personally I think that needs to continue and then more formal learning starts maybe seven onwards okay. which I believe is how schooling is structured more in Scandinavian countries mm. and in France. Thank you for your time Julia, I really appreciate it. That's all right, I've really enjoyed it. I'm speaking about my experiences and uh, I hope it helps. Thank you. Be healthy, take care of yourself and see you in the next video, guys. Bye.